marketing to order by the local planning agency. Uh, roll call, please. Jeff Maturo. Uh, he's excused. Okay. Carolyn Gallagher. Here. Rex Sims. Here. Chairman Sam Vincent. Here. Linda Schwartz. Here. Don Colapietro. Uh, excused. And Meg Jacobson. Excused. Well, we do have a quorum today. You have a quorum, and I'm go I'm also going to request to be excused. I have a mediation that um, deals with uh, BG Mine, so eventually you may, you know, if we're lucky, you may see us earlier than later. Yeah. Um, do you have anyone sitting in for you? Sorry? Do you have anyone sitting in no, for I you? No, I don't. I don't have, um, right now I'm in between assistant city attorneys. So what I wanted to do is, be, uh, yes, we'll call Terrell, um, our line, who is representing staff, um, and you can get him on the phone. Oh, do you have his number? There may be some legal opinions that are requested in this. I'm not sure, but there may be some okay. uh, explanations uh, about the uh, comp plan and so forth. So what I wanted to do ahead of the time, and, and that's fine, um, and we'll get Terrell on the phone. Terrell, um, our line, is outside counsel. He's a special land use counsel. He does, rep he does not represent the LPA. He represents city staff in this function. But he could explain to you uh, the comprehensive plan and comprehensive planning, as well as the app. Um, if, does the applicant have representa <coughs> legal representation? Or, okay. Um, but what I did is to, I wanted to do kind of like a charging instruction do a little explanation of comprehensive planning. It's probably more not for the LPA, um, but actually for those watching this hearing to have an understanding of what you're doing today. So unlike almost every other advisory board that the city has, the local planning agency is a legislatively mandated entity. So you're actually created by Florida statute. We appoint you. We have um, some statutes, ordinances on you. Um, but you are actually a statutory entity. And your number one duty, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, is preparation uh, of the comp plan or plan amendments and make recommendations to the governing body regarding any adoption or amendment. Today before you, you have one case, and it is a uh, private case where a citizen is requesting um, a comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, the applicant will make the rep uh, presentation Staff will provide also a report and their recommendation uh, for you to uh, go forward and act. Um, I'm not going to talk every word in this um, right. outline because I figured you would probably go crazy there. But amendments to a comprehensive plan, uh, there has been a lot of case law. Uh, David Theriak and I had the conversation a couple weeks ago when some of these cases came out. We were shocked when um, the smaller comp plans weren't determined to be quasi-judicial. But the Supreme Court has been very consistent in Florida that when you're dealing with comprehensive planning, no matter how specific the issue is, it's not a rezoning, and it is therefore legislative in nature. So why are we concerned that it's legislative instead of quasi-judicial? It's a different standard of review that you look at, and um, it's a different type of review. So this is the initial review when you do a comprehensive plan. People cannot go for rezoning um, if they need to go for rezoning, and that's not a case in this matter today, unless it is consistent or obtain any development orders unless their property is consistent with the comprehensive plan. So in this case, uh, the comprehensive plan uh, needs an amendment in the downtown area. You'll hear from the applicant. You'll hear from staff on that today. Um, and the standard that is used, is it fairly debatable? In, in other words, could reasonable people disagree as to the proprieti propriety of the action? And if you can meet that standard, uh, the city's decision is upheld. My concern is always, I want your decision to be upheld um, as a recommendation to council, and I want council's decision to be upheld. Okay. Uh, so that is my number one priority. Uh, not always what staff's decision is, not always, you know, th of course, not always the applicant, even citizens, <coughs> it's what council tells me. And of course, we don't know what council says until after it goes through all this process. Um, if you look at the outline, the last page of the outline 
is a comparison chart for both quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative <coughs> proceedings. So today, as I said, this is an um, application that you've received for a comprehensive plan. It is site-specific. Sometimes it, it doesn't have to be. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, legislative. Uh, there is additional government review on um, comprehensive planning. In this case, uh, this is a uh, your first public hearing. After this, uh, the property will go, or the property, the application will go to a transmittal hearing, and following the transmittal hearing, it will go to the state of Florida. Um, is this big enough? It, this one's going to the state? Okay. Sometimes there's some exceptions here. But it does get some it gets some state review regardless of the uh, different applications, and then after and they can assert jurisdiction, uh, the state and other agencies, um, if they don't agree with what the action is. Maybe there is a environmental species that they wanted to protect, um, a soil issue. There could be all different things, um, and then afterwards it goes to a final adoption hearing by city council. Um, again, I've talked about the, the legal review. If it's a rational decision, it's upheld. Um, and there is the comprehensive plan is the most important thing because we cannot take any action of anything inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. So uh, okay. your decision today is the start of many decisions in proceeding forward, uh, but it's probably the most critical path. Um, because it's the starting path. It talks about who can challenge and how the amendments go through. Um, I apologize, I'm not going to be here. I'm leaving right now. I will be available by phone if uh, there is anything uh, okay. necessary. Okay, you want to read this into the record? Or, or? Um, can I have your agenda? Do, do we have an agenda? My agenda is in the car, I apologize. I will read the case now into the record, and I apologize for not being here. So this is to review and transmit. Uh, the application number is CPA 1631796BOS, which is an amendment to the comprehensive plan considering a text amendment to the future land use element, policy 1.1.15, Old 41 Town Center Mixed Use Redevelopment Overlay Area in, accord, um, in accordance with the procedure set forth in Chapter 163, Florida Statutes, as set forth in the request by Benita Old 41 LLC. Alexis Crespo is the agent. Um, Ms. Crespo can proceed with her case. Uh, this is also because it is uh, legislative and not quasi-judicial. We do not swear in witnesses. Um, I know you all know this, I'm yeah. doing this for the record. Mm -hmm. um, but you can proceed in your case, and then staff will uh, proceed after that, and I'm available by phone. Okay, thank you. Let me say something first. Uh, this is uh, very comprehensive, and uh, I'm going to hold public comment until after the presentation and staff presentation because there's so much information here that needs to be read into and addressed and looked at. Uh, I don't think any comments now would be helpful to us unless they know uh, quite a bit about this case. So let's proceed. Excellent. Good morning. For the record, Alexis Crespo with Waldrop Engineering, representing the applicant. Can, can yeah. you hear me better now? Thank you. Well, good morning. We are happy to be here today and, and very excited to discuss a proposed text amendment relating to downtown Bonita Springs or the old US 41 redevelopment area. We have prepared a, a detailed presentation to walk you through um, what we are proposing in terms of this text amendment. and. Um, Audrey has done a great job of kind of explaining the difference between comp planning and zoning uh, and we are kind of going off script here um, in that we are going to get into some of the zoning level details of the applicant's property because we think that really helps explain why this text amendment is is needed to support the vision for redevelopment in downtown Bonita Springs so we will get into zoning level details but again we are here to discuss a comprehensive planning uh, request um, joining me um, on the presentation team is Ryan Binkowski, also with Waldrop Engineering. Um, he is senior uh, vice president and his background is in landscape architecture. So he'll be discussing the urban form and fabric of downtown Bonita Springs and how this site and the text amendment will fit in well with that um, form. Let me ask, is the, is the uh, architect of record here? Yes, sir. That was next on the list. Okay, thank you. Thank Wojciech you. Kulicki and Ray Peshikin with PK Architects, thank you. Um, a very prominent firm 
uh, heavily involved in redevelopment in downtown Naples, who we'll hear from as well. And again, getting into more zoning level types of details with the architectural elevations, but certainly we felt that it was important to bring uh, the project to life before you today. So getting into what we're gonna touch on. You might. We want to um, start kind of with the downtown Benita Springs vision and just revisit what the city established when they incorporated as the vision for redevelopment. Um, because the great thing is really nothing has changed. Um, the desires for downtown have remained the same since um, the redevelopment plan was adopted. And again, this fits in very well with that vision. We'll also get into the details of the text amendment request and then roll into some of the site specific information relating to um, the proposed development. I was negligent in, in introducing the property owners and applicants, uh, Tony Manzalillo and Mark Shapiro, very heavily invested in your downtown area. Um, they have members of the Downtown Alliance here today as well. Um, yeah, well they're very active in, so. And they're available for questions. And then we'll close up with discussion on why this amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan as a whole, as well as the staff report. So just to briefly touch on uh, what is the city's stated vision for downtown Bonita Springs, I've used the illustrative um, rendering that was developed, I think back in 08, showing um, the field that was wanted along old US 41, the, the clustered uh, development form along the roadway, mixes of uses, and also a real nice coastal uh, character and flavor um, that reflects downtown Bonita Springs as opposed to more urbanized areas um, across Southwest Florida. And what the uh, vision statement says in the comprehensive plan and other supporting documents is that downtown Bonita Springs is the heart and social center of the city and nothing has changed in that regard. This is where the city seeks to draw people in the form of festivals that are currently very successful, but also through the redevelopment of a mix of land uses where people can live, work and play and be drawn to this area to recreate. Uh, mixed use is not defined in, in the Bonita plan, but we can look to other um, relevant sources both um, within the state of Florida as well as nationally recognized um, examples. And, and really, it's very consistent. Mixed use development is where two or more compatible land uses are integrated into one project um, in a way where it is very well integrated, connected with um, the ability for pedestrians to move between the land uses very easily. Lee County goes on to say that true mixed use is where those uses are integrated into the same building. So vertically integrated mixed use where you have a ground floor office or retail or restaurant and upper story uh, condominiums, apartments, et cetera. And that's really um, the heart of the definition uh, of mixed use development. And what we're really is the core of the request before you today is to achieve that sort of mixed use development within the downtown area. So to summarize our request, we are proposing amendment to policy 1.111A5 relating to the old 41 town center, um, seeking to allow the blending of densities and intensities within a commonly defined planned unit development or planned development zoning district. Um, this would not increase intensities or densities permitted on a given property. Um, those would remain the same. It would not allow for additional uses on, on the property. It would simply allow for the commercial and the residential to be integrated onto a common project. So we'll emphasize that throughout the, the presentation. So the text that you'll see, I'm not gonna read this verbatim, it's in your package and I'm sure you'll wanna kinda go through it. I know you like to go kinda line by line to, to really understand what's being proposed. But again, a planned development rezoning is required to enact this policy um, and it would allow for the blending of uses within, um, within a given property. <coughs> this would only be applicable within the town center of your old 41 area master plan. You have edges where you um, integrate into the single family neighborhoods around downtown, and we didn't think that would be appropriate in those areas. We, we thought where you want your mixed use and your mixed use in one building would be along your US 41 frontages, <coughs> excuse me, and along your street frontages. So we wanted to control um, the, and limit the, the text amendment in that way. This would allow for a unified rezoning application to be reviewed by your staff as well as your zoning board and council. Um, and we put in pr provisions to address compatibility. So as you enact this policy and you move towards single family along the edges, you'll have to step down density intensity uh, as can be uh, well controlled through your PD rezoning process. And we also put a limit on intensities not to exceed 0.5 floor area ratio outside your urban core. 
which is significantly lower than what is permitted within the urban core, which is 1.2 FAR. So why is this amendment needed? This is an excerpt of your current redevelopment master plan. This plan is, is, a, is obviously a map exhibit in, in your comprehensive plan. It's also enacted by policy. So it's, there is text about this plan as well that, that speaks to these sub areas. And so the downtown area um, is divided into a single family, townhome, multifamily, mixed use commercial, and institutional. So instead of having very broad categories that allow for a mix of uses, um, the map is colored with these different areas that are very limiting in terms of the use permitted. And to further explain that, I'm kind of zooming in on that red boundary, which is your town center, which is where this would apply. So sub area 3A and 3B, and I'll just point those out because I know this is busy with all the colors. 3A is less than a block south of the major node of Terry Street and Old 41. So right at the key intersection of downtown and the gateway to downtown. 3A, per your current plan, only allows for a commercial building to be developed on those properties. You could not do a mixed use building on your old 41 frontage less than a block south of, of the key intersection to the, to, to the community. And the applicants um, have done mixed use developments across the country, um, primarily in the Northeast, and, and their vision for their properties is absolutely mixed use buildings with the upper story residential, which we feel is very consistent with the vision. Unfortunately, the sub areas are, are very restricting in their uses. The other sub area is four, which I'll point out, which is also directly abutting Terry Street. So we've got a, a sub area abutting your arterial roadway, again, within a block of, of the key intersection and gateway to downtown that only allows for residential. You couldn't do any lower intensity office space or, or things of that nature uh, on those four properties. So your mixed use is really limited to your, your 6B along the river, which we certainly feel is appropriate for mixed use, but this is the only place where you can have it as your, as your plan currently sits. And just to bring it to, oh, I got little circles there. So when we look at the, the properties owned by the applicant, and this is not a site-specific amendment, I'll just clarify that, it's, it's, it applies to the the lands within the town center, if they bring you a unified plan development, they could enact this policy. So it's not specifically for their property, but we would certainly be proposing it to be utilized there. So these are the four properties that um, Mark and Tony own. Uh, this is the Maria's property, the, the one to the west of Old 41, and mixed use is permitted. That is the one property out of four where they can enact their vision of a true mixed use building commercial only on the other property that fronts directly on US 41, residential only on, on the uh, track that fronts on Terry Street, and then residential only um, as you move further west towards Lightner's Creek. And I'll just go ahead and I'll say this because I think it's helpful to kind of repeat key points. We feel that residential only is appropriate because this is, again, a transitioning piece that is getting into the, the single family neighborhoods to the east of downtown. So you'll see when um, our team presents the plans that we're proposing to maintain this as, a, as a, a residential only use. So we're not seeking to have a mixed use there, just if it provides any comfort on compatibility. So the request will allow for mixed use buildings in several sub areas, again, through the PD rezoning process and through the public hearing process associated with that. The proposed text amendment will allow for flexibility to allow for mixed use development but still have safeguards in place so that you know each project, if proposing to blend density and intensity, is going through a very thorough rezoning process with your town staff. And, and I can tell you we've been working on this over a year, so it is a, a thorough review process where, where things are getting vetted. This does not require a change to your future land use map or the overlay map. It works with those sub areas. People can, can comply with the sub areas or they can come in with the PD rezone. So it provides flexibility and, and another option without changing your map. It only applies to the town center, so that uh, where these, this blending can occur is, is very controlled in terms of its location. Um, and it's gonna allow for the vision to be enacted for, for the true integrated mixed use in downtown. I've kind of touched on compatibility already. Um, the, the text that we're proposing has some sub policies 
to ensure that it's understood that any applicant needs to provide for compatibility in their application. They need to discuss buffers, building heights, setbacks, and, and transition of uses so that you're not putting a very intensive mixed use building with a restaurant uh, right next to a uh, single family on the edge of downtown. Um, we've limited the commercial intensity to a much lower floor area ratio or intensity than the other downtown parcels when outside of that urban core and again provided for the, the process of review. So again to touch on this point, the proposed text will not allow an applicant to go in and get more density than their property already allows for. It will not allow them to get more commercial square footage than their property allows for. It will not allow them to exceed the building heights established for downtown, which is 52 feet in height. Um, it doesn't uh, relax any development standards, parking standards, all that's in place and not being modified in any way through this text amendment. Infrastructure, um, through any comprehensive plan amendment process, text or otherwise, you've got to demonstrate that what you're proposing doesn't impact infrastructure needs and certainly the city has been um, working on infrastructure in downtown for a while and investing a lot of a lot of money in infrastructure improvements but our analysis and staff um, is in agreement is that because this is blending and not increasing density or intensity there really is no impact on infrastructure certainly mixed use development has the ability to reduce um, impacts on infrastructure because people are walking more using the roads less um, and it can be a much more sustainable type of development pattern so we've provided that data and analysis. We've provided letters of availability demonstrating that this text amendment complies with that requirement. And with that introduction of, of the meat of the amendment, we're gonna step into the site specifics of, of what this text amendment will allow from, a, from an urban form and architectural standpoint, unless you have any questions. Are we ready for questions? Uh, if you want to ask Alexis, oh, well, yes. Just a quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, we went to great lengths here in the past year or two uh, uh, to provide the uh, uh, light commercial or light, uh, yeah, light commercial, I guess you call it, on the east side of Feltz. And Feltz is inside the zone that we're talking about. So if someone wanted, to, and then there, but there was no provision for anything like this multi-story uh, my question is if is this an option that could be used on felt street is this the kind of future that we're looking at there we'll go back to that. i'm going to bring up the map if that helps uh, you. i'm going I'm to go ahead and address that real quick because it's it's easy to address one of the things that is Part of this application, and we'll get to the staff report, is that this is narrowly scoped um, to prevent any unintended consequences of that happening. And so, no, we would not be seeing a five-story building on Felt. So it's still going to be limited to the, the three-story that it is currently allowed. It's still going to be limited to the uses that are currently allowed. This would not impinge upon that district the way that the text is written as, as, as proposed. So, we so you're saying this uh, having a mixed use on in the Feltz development that we've we've developed is not a desirable thing. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is this change wouldn't affect that. Okay. However, a an amendment such as this could could happen in the future. What I think you look at is this changes how the density and intensity is spread out through a development. What it doesn't do is change the intent of that subdistrict because the whole purpose of that subdistrict was to create a transition between the downtown and the lower intensity and density to, to the east. So while you might be able to blend uh, certain developments, it does not change how that development needs to step down in intensity before it goes to outside of the downtown district to the east into that single family. Is this considered a blending between single family and and commercial no, no it, it wouldn't be and, and and the reason is is that um, if if we go back this text amendment would only be applicable in the town center area on the comp plan which is very well defined and and, and well the east side of felt street is mm -hmm. in that the the east side of felts only for one parcel 
uh, north of Wilson is, is included in that area. Okay. And that's the parcel that the city owns okay. with the drainages. <clears throat> well, my, my thought was here we <clears throat> laid out Felt Street as a commercial development, and are we going to be coming back and saying this is a, a something that we need to be going through in the future in, in areas like that? Well, this, <coughs> actually, we are going to be looking at the downtown because currently we're preparing a white paper for the whole area, and that's going to be discussed at council in December. And depending on what comes out of that, we could have many more discussions regarding uses or whatever they happen to, to want to discuss, uh, or perhaps no discussions. But that will be decided uh, in, a, in about a month. Okay, thank you. Let me ask a question here. Uh, every it would be fair to say that we're only looking at two properties that are being really discussed to be changed. Uh, the other two meets mixed use and the one uh, next to the residential is residential. So we're looking at two properties that we need to combine and make a mixed use out of it. One's commercial, one is residential. Not, not necessarily. And, and, and um, it, but we're getting a little bit into our, our presentation, but, but I'll address it real quickly. If, if we, this amendment, as, as they have proposed it, they have very narrowly scoped this amendment. And basically it is in the town center uh, area. Can you go back to your slide? Here you go. Mm -hmm. So the red area is the only area within that boundary that this, that this would apply. So if you look at that from a practical standpoint, um, the opportunities to blend there are, um, I think, three other properties to the south of the property that the applicants own. Uh, you have the Wonder Gardens property, you have the Bamboo Village and um, property, and, and the city parks. So, and so, and I think there's one other parcel back there that someone owns um, by the park uh, where the, uh, uh, across from Bamboo. So it's, it's a very narrow, it's a very narrowly scoped amendment. And the idea is, is that from a staff's perspective, this really is the north gateway into the downtown. And so you do want to make a statement uh, there. And the, the concept that it be a planned development versus just a use by right in order to do this um, gives the opportunity for the flexibility of negotiating what, what makes the most sense. They come in and ask, they need to protect the, the neighborhoods with their intensities or height. Um, and how it, it flows at the same time, they don't lose uh, density they need to to support the businesses. The other opportunity that exists here that uh, from a staff's perspective is very important is that this is an area close to the river. And so if without any regulations where we would say, uh, come in and negotiate with us, typically they would build, a, some of them would come in and build a building four to six feet above the road to meet flood. And one of the things that staff has made clear uh, to the applicant, it would be the staff's desire that in a planned development, we would negotiate to have those buildings flood proofed so the entrances could come in at street level to encourage the walkability. There's other cities that have done this, Ponte Gorda, for instance, has done this, um, to, to encourage that same walkability, plus uh, it lowers the intensity uh, and the impact on the community. But the PD is the appropriate way and mechanism from our perspective to to accomplish those goals and so this leads them to the path if, if they're acquiring property to the PD so that they can uh, more adequately address all of the needs both of the community and their needs in a comprehensive way uh, I agree with you what you're saying but my question really was focused on the real issue here one is zoned commercial doesn't allow mixed use. One is zoned residential, doesn't allow mixed use. So what we're doing is uh, passing an amendment here that says we want to combine these two, which is not presently allowed. Correct. Okay. Correct. I just want to be sure that everyone understands what, what the real issue is. It's not the other two pieces of property. It's a little more simple than that. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. Hi, good morning. Ryan Binkowski with Waldrop Engineering. I think actually at the point of the conversation, this is a perfect segue into the topic that I'm here to discuss. Um, in preparing for this and the rezoning, we, we kept coming up with 
similar questions that you, that you're you're asking there, Sam. And um, while Jay jumped quickly into the related policy behind that question at a level of detail, respective of the project um, before you, we also took some time to stand back and look at actually how this fits into the town fabric, uh, both existing and then ultimately with the redevelopment plan and the Bonita Springs vision, what ultimately it could be and what it's desired to be right now by, by seated council. So uh, some of that is interpretation, no doubt, and some of what I'm going to talk about is certainly uh, a vision. It's not intended to represent what we're proposing in terms of any changes to density or intensity. Um, but what we are trying to do is uh, raise some awareness of town planning and what urban design does in order to shape and frame that vision that a town like us has going forward. Um, so with that said, uh, the, the current plan as, as we look at it, and I don't, I don't want to get too academic with this, but I'm trying to show some really basic things. Um, I really want to um, address town, the, the form of what Old 41 is today versus what our amendment allows uh, the project to go forward to be, and ultimately how that is respectful of where the vision of Bonita Springs is going. Uh, we can draw some corollaries along the way. Um, so on the left, you see your town plan, and we wanted to show a scale image of what the figure ground is. That means what is the building footprints of Bonita Springs in this area? And, and how does that look in terms of just a sheer understanding of the density and intensity of actual buildings along these corridors. We have a lot, a lot of intensity thought of and conceived in this plan. However, we're trying to be reasonable, reasonably critical of what this plan allows and, do, and what it does not allow. This, this was realized at a point where um, the old 41 redevelopment project wasn't understood. It wasn't realized in terms of a vision only thought of as something that could happen one day. Uh, now that that's occurred and in which the way the redevelopment project has occurred, uh, it, it is going to usher in some of these projects like what we're talking about today, but with a, a framework plan, excuse me, with a framework plan that does not exactly allow what the vision is hoping for. Um, so the old 41 corridor uniquely has a couple buildings that are dense along its corridor but you know if you look at the the general density and the, the amount of square footage that's in this corridor doesn't vary much from the rest of the residential fabric adjacent to it that's inconsistent with a main street in any given town you think of some local florida towns Puna Gord is a good example fort myers is a good example downtown naples on fifth avenue after its redevelopment is a really great example mount dora up north which is a very organic turn of the century town uh, similarly um, we go on there's there's a lot of them um, generally speaking across the united states the old railroad towns out west where all that commerce and activity took place downtown the transient populations and I mean that in a positive way where they were related to that commerce and those mixes of uses that needed to occur happened in that downtown corridor the redevelopment project as it's as moving forward is going to usher in some of that vision so from a, a overall picture view of things you know it's kind of hard to tell we've got a beautiful town a lot of vegetation old trees unique character trees hopefully you know we don't see too many storms where we lose those but the storefront is what helps create the vision. The architectural form of our community has some, some problems and there's ways to make that more beautiful. A lot of the visioning and a lot of what people talk about and what the public has brought to the uh, past discussions is always concerned about the density, the intensity, how high are the buildings, what are the uses, oh that's too much commercial. But a lot of these statements along the way and these concerns can be regarded as objective when they're not understood on how it provides value to what the vision is and what the economic vision is of Old 41. This is what you want. People talk about Old Naples, they talk about the shops, they talk about the cafes, how nice of a place it is to live. And um, in order to get this, there needs to be some changes over time. Our amendment's not the first one, is where we're reasonably critical. What we're doing is trying to continue to move the city forward 
we're we're a business partner in this community as much as you know a, a lot of people that are currently vested in this corridor um, however a town plan to be created like this has to have a little bit more density initially you look at this and say oh that's too dense I did myself but that's Fifth Avenue in Naples and there's a, there's a lot more on the ground in terms of building footprint than expected and some allowance for you know accommodating you know, th these types of uses in a corridor is going to have to realize the ability for this to occur so in a quick series of slides I wanted to represent how we positioned our vision for this project um, that um, uh, Tony and Mark want to bring forward as something that's an evolution of what we have today where we can make a minor surgical change um, in this text amendment to allow for continued development however also you know pr begins to present an understanding of the changes we have to make as a community and with staff in order to help usher in what is going to be a, a, a more concise um, footprint and a plan a revised plan that would allow for some of these things to happen so this is you know fiddle fuddle on the right it's just us putting some boxes on a plan but that's not atypical of what the footprint of the plan looks like in a downtown Naples Fifth Avenue situation compared to on the left what your current figure ground is in terms of a footprint um, the density that's allowed on much of the properties along old 41 is highly underutilized and in order to get to this downtown vision and this economic vision that old 41 could be some of what is on the right has to be allowed to occur and where that happens is wholly up to you the council and staff so zooming into this area I wanted to explain how our project is relevant to this this bigger picture town core vision generally speaking this figure ground explains what you know density could be allowed on a property um, overall not specifically with our amendment what our amendment allows us to do is simply what we're bringing forth in our plan but if we wanted to develop a downtown Main Street type um, um, form this is this is ultimately what the footprint could look like now we talk about uses what's appropriate use in, in urban planning um, oftentimes uh, you'll have a concept plan sometimes that's even formalized into what, what we would refer to as a regulating plan that regulating plan is based in land use and then it also regulates your intensity and um, your density and intensity but it does it with a, a, a method called um, transect design um, transect design would be such that a given transect is an area think of it as blocks or overlapping blocks um, in the in a map and what is allowed in one transect is compatible to the adjacent transects so you might have mixed use urban corridor down old 41 and that's very appropriate for what you know the vision of old 41 might be in a given segment of it however the segment to the east in this in this case here where it turns red starts to allow for residential condo or commercial uh, use uh, wholly in the building as opposed to ground floor commercial and uh, such and then as it begins to move further away from that town core the density would reduce all right and then ultimately you go from an, uh, an apartment or a loft type condition to uh, maybe a shorter building uh, a town home a, you know a two-story condo ultimately getting to a point where you're just a single family house like the current adjacent fabric of old 41 is at some point in the future planning of Bonita Springs that concept needs to be realized whether it's in the formalized version of a regulating plan or simply just within the individual zoning on a block to block basis our project if you see the purple and the red buildings overlaid is relatively small in the big picture of this concept and remember you know th this roadway is more than a mile long to the south um, there, there's a lot of other impacts and thought and visioning that has to go into how that planning would take place but you can see uh, you know just conceptually how these buildings would fit in and then today you know as we go forward it's important to recognize that our project is one project and these understand the understanding of what the vision is going to be of Bonita Springs going forward needs to be realized because it's not going to happen overnight and our clients know that it's very difficult to be able to acquire larger pieces of land to be able to do one comprehensive development across an entire city block 
as much as that would be real, you know, realistic to do if it were acquirable, it's very difficult to do from you know, where the current state and the investment that the residences and businesses have now. So bit by bit, it's going to have to be able to occur and how that fits into uh, future considerations as well is, is, is something that needs to be noted. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and transition um, to uh, Wojciech. Um, he's going to give a, a presentation for you all um, regarding uh, what the actual specifics of our project look like so you understand, you know, on the street level what things, you know, are in terms of tangible look. You know, I'd like to say that was a very nice presentation. Thanks. Uh, uh, you drill down to elements that uh, really make a difference, and you explained it very well. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Wojciech Kalicki. I'm an architect with PK Studios. Uh, we're a 30, almost 31-year-old firm located in Naples, Florida, uh, and we're part of the development team on this project. Um, what you see up on the screen is the project overview. We'll hit some of these points during my presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and skip through this here. Um, I included this image because this is really what, what brought me down to Naples um, 12 years ago when I first visited, and uh, one of the main reasons that I, that I live here. Um, the feeling that you get walking down Fifth Avenue and the activity that's there and the feeling of safety and um, uh, of community is really strong. and um, I think what um, Ryan was getting to is, is um, that, that's something that Bonita Springs could um, definitely benefit from, and, and the way that we move forward and develop um, Old 41 is, is important. Um, some of the things that make Fifth Avenue in, in particular um, successful, the scale of the buildings, the activity along the street, the uh, putting the parking behind buildings instead of in front build in front of buildings, um, incorporating things like outdoor dining really bring the street alive. Um, these are three different projects that our firm actually did on Fifth Avenue, and while the styles are all different, they all contribute um, to the fabric of that street and really make it make the street successful. Uh, this is an overview of our site, just to give you a sense of scale of of what we're proposing. Uh, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but I really want to start in the details of, of what it is that our project is after. Um, the project proposes using ground floor walkways along the streets to um, really engage the pedestrian scale of um, Old 41. We've got some outside seating for uh, potential restaurants that could be on the ground floor, and we want to make sure that the ground floor is at street level and that it is um, a commercial use, either retail office or restaurant, um, to um, really uh, engage the, what, what we're really trying to do is engage pedestrians, is to, is to make sure that the pedestrian feels comfortable walking along US 41. Uh, we're using landscaping to um, soften the scale of the buildings and, um, and really provide a, a buffer between the roadway and the uh, sidewalks along the along the road. Um, you'll see here a, a crosswalk along uh, between the two sites at uh, Old 41, and we want to make sure that we can connect a larger network um, of sidewalks along US 41 to eventually realize the vision that uh, Ryan was talking about earlier, where you can travel um, on foot along that roadway and really feel like um, like you're part of an active street. Uh, one of the things that was really successful on, uh, on Fifth Avenue in Naples was interconnecting buildings uh, through uh, buildings. So you, you would have a, a connection from the front of the building to the back of the building where there was more activity or parking or parks or um, things of that nature. So you could actually um, not only utilize the uh, Fifth Avenue corridor, but also adjacent streets and adjacent spaces. Uh, and that, that corridor becomes a, uh, an area of activity, both within it and then behind it. We are also uh, really taking a deliberate approach to the design of the street corridor. You'll see that the first floor is, is out um, at, uh, at the street level, but then the second floor and third floor step back. That 
allows for that pedestrian scale along the street, but then also opens up the, the street corridor a little bit so you don't feel like you're walking or driving through a, a tunnel necessarily. Um, that really helps to design the street fabric. Uh, some of you might recognize this. This is uh, Imperial Landing. This is a rendering that our firm did for uh, the winning proposal for that about a decade ago. And you'll see some of those same elements there. Um, ground floor walkways really engaging the riverfront. Uh, you've got uh, parking that's either hidden under structures or behind structures and uh, a really strong connection to the uh, pedestrian network as it travels through the site. Just a couple more examples of, of uh, the vision. I think Ryan touched on, on this, so I won't dwell too much on it. But that's the, really the feeling that we're after is, is a um, cozy, safe, engaging downtown area. And what you end up, is, uh, what you end up with is a um, streetscape that looks somewhat like this. I uh, just want to close with some of the more specific details. We're requesting uh, for this site specifically 80 dwelling units and 29,000 square feet of commercial. Um, the commercial components are limited to the three buildings on the west side of the property and then the, um, the buildings along uh, Center Avenue are going to be townhomes, residential type properties. All commercial is going to be or most of the uh, commercial is going to be on the ground floors. We want restaurants, office, and retail to really engage pedestrian and, and uh, vehicular uses. Um, connection was very important for the site for us. So those red arrows and red lines that you see all over the plan are, are really us thinking through how someone might travel throughout the site, uh, both if they're coming up and down Old 41 or if they're parking and engaging the site that way. We've designed a park that cuts through and connects the buildings on the site, also is able to connect down to the riverfront and provide a uh, launch there. And um, that park is meant to provide a variety of, of hardscape and landscape uses with lots of different materials and, um, and different ways to engage that, uh, that space uh, if you want to sit, if you want to play, if you just want to walk around or uh, in enjoy it. Um, so that's, that's the goal for the site. Uh, so I think overall, I think this is a pretty transformative project for downtown. I know there are some others planned uh, in the near future, but we think uh, this would fit well with the vision that Benita has for, for the um, Old 41 corridor. And I'm happy to take questions or we'll turn it back to Alexis. I'll start with uh, several questions that I might have. <clears throat> in your renderings, uh, the buildings that are depicted, say in the first rendering, is that uh, showing uh, 12 feet from the street or property line? In your very first rendering, there, back, yeah, this there. This one? Yeah, what are we looking at there? Where's the property line here? Um. That yeah. So in, in this instance here, generally the property line is at this location. Right okay. Um, it's currently where the redevelopment project ends the sidewalk in this location. Yeah. It's within about a foot and a half of that okay. sidewalk. The reason I asked that question is because it looks like there's a lot of, a lot of uh, area there. And I want to be sure that, that the building is where it should be. Uh, the, the next question has to do with... Uh, uh, and you can go to your plan view for that, is connectivity. Uh, why do you think your solution for the connectivity is successful? Uh, I'm talking about connecting the building on the left to the building on the right. Uh, in reality, how does the public know that there is connectivity here, and uh, not only visually, but physically? Mm -hmm. um. I think if you take the example of fifth, if you have elements um, such as this that cut through buildings, uh, people naturally want to explore what's behind those structures. Um, I think signage certainly plays uh, one uh, as one component, but if you provide a, uh, an attractive enough um, visual marker in the distance uh, on an element like this, people are naturally drawn to that. And I think 
that's that's what we would aim to achieve there. Uh, the connectivity I think I'm speaking of is if I'm driving a car on on O forty one road and there are two buildings, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, what I'm looking for is a marker uh, that connects those two buildings to show that that's one development. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something that uh, the director has talked about before, isn't it? And that was one of the things we were going after in this project is, is how does the public know uh, intuitively that these two projects are connected? What makes that happen? I think we'd want to look for consistency in uh, architectural style. We also have um, a crosswalk, a pretty prominent crosswalk that's going to occur there. Uh, we have similar landscaping that's going to connect those two buildings. So um, I, I don't think um, I don't think you'll be able to mistake that those two buildings are, are not connected. I think it's going to be pretty clear from from our vision of of what we want to see happen there. I understand it. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, was. Uh, this is an important point because when it's built, you don't know until you build it is what will happen. And so what I try to do is overemphasize that fact. And that's what you, I think you want to look at. How do you overemphasize that with landscaping, pergolas, things like that that, that say that there's a connection here? Uh, because the, I think the owner does want the people to know that this is not one building. This is many buildings. And that's the impressive part of this project. Is, 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 is large thinking, and I think that, that Tony realizes that, and I know he's looking for that sort of thing. The last question, uh, I guess, would have to do with- Mr. Mr. Vincent, may I interrupt just one, yeah. one brief moment? Because I think it's important also to add that um, with regard to the form that we're talking about, certainly you know, beyond the accoutrements right, of the site, mm -hmm. and a fountain would, would be a great focal point. A pergola or arbors to help lead and guide a pathway right. is one thing. but. One thing that will begin to evolve as the city of Bonita Springs continues to redevelop is a formulation of a, a new parking habit in the downtown. And that's not something that is necessarily visualized at this point from a, a general pedestrian or a vehicular traveler through these spaces. And when it becomes the case where there's limited on-street parking and people have to begin to find themselves behind these buildings and within these individual development blocks, they will begin to um, exist in those spaces that they don't currently today. That will be the parking lot in between and behind the buildings internal to the blocks. And a lot of the cases is going to be people recognize those developments individually because they have to park in them to walk out and experience the street itself. So I think that, that uh, if you know what I'm talking about is that I, what I'm looking for is a celebration of the threshold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of what, what I'm really driving at. The other question has to do with the many examples of Naples that you've shown. <clears throat> I've been in the city for a long time now. There are a lot of people here that reject that idea that uh, Naples is a panacea of architecture and the urban environment, or what I say, European model. Uh, so as you present to this council, I would think you'd want to look at uh, how you might present that carefully, uh, as there are a lot of people here and on the council that don't necessarily want the European model, mm -hmm. nor the model that Naples has. So. Uh, just as a, a point uh, that I'm trying to make here is that that's going to be very important to you. I think the architecture is very well done. You've done a very nice job with that because I've seen it before and I've studied it. Uh, I think uh, it would work very well downtown in Benita. And uh, I, I think more conversation about how this really serves as a catalyst, you know, in drilling down as you did. How do you drill down to the personalities and the feelings that people have about their city and why this particular model, because this is only one example of many alternative solutions that you could have. And so when someone asks about those alternatives, you need to be able to express why this is the best alternative. I, I have just a question out of curiosity. Um, have you thought about using any kind of pervious materials for parking lots and sidewalks and all of that kind of stuff? Uh, yes, we have. We, uh, we're looking at a variety of materials for, for those back areas. A lot of the parking is going to be on the ground, but there is going to be also some, some surface parking. And depending on which uh, way we end up going forward with water management and so forth, we certainly look at that. 
Rex, do you have, have anything? I have a question for Jay. Uh, that was a very, very nice presentation and it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you and I have discussed this before and, and I'm not clear yet, but we have a section here that's revised exhibit four and it's uh, on the zoning and it applies to this particular project exclusively as I understand it. And the first page of it is the affordable housing density bonus uh, and the six um, rules on how you get that. Uh, which I think we have uh, <coughs> discussed in the past and a couple of the things in B are not as um, um, well described as uh, they should be. Um, you can get a density bonus. Now this doesn't just apply to this, but this applies to anything in the overlay district. So you can get a, a, a bonus density for unique design solutions. <coughs> That's uh, based on somebody's interpretation. And I'm quite sure that uh, half a dozen of us here could have different interpretations. I don't know how that's applied. Okay. The second thing is the contribution of the cost uh, means that you can buy parking spaces or something uh, and, and contribute to that, but there's no, um, help me, no formula, there's no uh, reasoning on how you get to that. And <coughs> Mr. Sims, may I address that? I think I have a really simple okay, answer well to it. One other thing. Now those are the reasons for the bonus density. So then when we go We to aren't the seeking bonus density. We are utilizing the standard density okay. to achieve the units we within go to the, the next project. Page. Okay. And and we've had this discussion before. In under item three, under the multifamily, it's fifteen units to the acre. And that's what this board has worked a long time to establish back when we were laying this out back in the beginning. And we understand that. <coughs> but now, and that would be subject to the bonus density. Now, when I go down to unit five, it says mixed use, that's 20 units to the acre. And my question is, under item five, does the mixed use, does the bonus apply to that also? Give me a second because <clears throat> the answer uh, I, I know is yes, so I gotta find the right the right section for you. It's well it's not page, it says page one, <laughs> page three. So. But it's of the um, revised exhibit four A I V here we go. A five. My, my two questions are just basically rather simple. One of them is how do we really establish bonus density? And the second thing is, does the same application for mixed use and uh, mixed use or multifamily residential and mixed use apply in both cases? So let's, we can, we'll, we'll have a brief conversation, but that's something that already exists. It's not part of this application, but we'll talk about it real quick so that everybody can understand and, and, and feel well, we want to know how you get comfortable to there. That's so the important thing. You can, you can get bonus density a variety of ways, okay? Uh, and, and basically there's three ways that you get bonus density in the downtown. Uh, one way is is that you can provide affordable housing or make a contribution in lieu of for the affordable housing. Uh, the second way is is that you can convert um, floor air ratio into commercial mixed use into additional density uh, under a formula, uh, and it's 
not overly complicated, but, but basically at, at least 65% of all of your intensity for that commercial area has to come from commercial. So you just can't take a commercial site and turn it into a whole bunch of apartments. Because um, part of the idea of the downtown is you need commercial, um, but at the same point in time, you need feet on the ground to support the commercial. And if you want to walk a community, it's pretty well established that there's a certain distance, and it varies from community to community, that people are willing to walk. Uh, and it's, it's one of those ironic things. They may only be willing to walk 500 feet to the store, but once to the store, they'll walk two miles uh, to, to go shopping. But it is one of those things that um, there is that, that method, and there's the bicycling, and there's all these different opportunities. And so we look at that, and, and, and do you want a higher density to support these shops? And the answer is yes. The third way is, is that if somebody comes in with a unique design solution, uh, and a perfect example is, you know, we have a policy to provide access to the river, a uh, policy to provide uh, kayaking and, and, and boat launches. And, and those are things that are highly desirable and sought at, uh, after it inside the comp plan. So if you do those things, uh, you can get credit for the ex expense of doing those things. And the code allows for a multiplication factor because uh, of how valuable that uh, the city deems that to be. Um, just adding some parking spaces may not be as valuable as adding access to the river. Uh, and so there's a, an opportunity to, to multiply that, uh, the dollars that you spend. And basically that becomes, for lack of a better word, monopoly money that you can spend to purchase the same way as you would make the contribution for the purchase of affordable housing bonus density. And that's, that's the way it works. Uh, we've only had one, one developer say they want to do it. They have not uh, come through yet, um, but their, their plan was approved based upon them doing that and, and that they have not started their development. So th those are the basic opportunities to, to, <coughs> to gain it. As far as um, the, the mixed use, and, and if you look at the densities, you have the densities, um, and the mixed use is 15, and um, your multifamily is 10, and then you have the opportunities for the bonus, uh, which you can get an additional five uh, units um, in, in the multifamily. Um, so the opportunity for those bonus densities are, are through the conversion of the FAR in, in the mixed use. Uh, and, and, and they can be rather substantial, but if the, mix, if, if the density that's being granted in the mixed use supports the commercial to make the commercial viable, that's what you're trying to accomplish. Um, one of the things that about this petition, this application, is the, the language is, is set up so that they're asking to be able to blend within a project. So that if they have some additional units or some additional commercial they'd like to build, they can do it, but they can, and they would do that through the PD process, which is technically a rezoning, but they would have to do it as in compatibility with the comprehensive plan. So if, if they are surrounded, for instance, uh, they have the property that's west of Center Street, and that property is, is bounded on the north by some residential and on the uh, east by some residential and on the south by some residential, it's going to be residential because it would be, it wouldn't be compliant with the policies of the comp plan to do it otherwise. But if there's a few more units there um, and it's all within the building and the setbacks and the parking and everything else, it would allow the blending. On the other hand, if they're next to a gas station, and, and because they're next to the gas station for some reason, that was still a multifamily area, it could be appropriate that you would have a first floor commercial, for instance, to blend the uses to buffer against the gas station that is there because who's gonna to wanna to live in an apartment first floor against the gas station? But we all know and understand that in a multi-story building, there are people who, live, who would gladly live next to a gas station on the third floor because of the view of the city and the view of the river and the other things that, uh, that they would be able to, to have. And so the question in this petition is that have, have the applicant narrowly scoped the requirements and do all of the existing requirements within the comp plan still 
pertain, and the fact is that they do. So they, this only gives them an opportunity to come in and make a case. This does not guarantee anybody's approval. They still have to meet all the elements within the comp plan. Mm -hmm. Now, they can do, if they can do that, and, and they've been working very hard on this, and I believe they probably can do that with, with their application, but it's, it's not some uh, open check that they get to do whatever they want. They have to still meet all those specific requirements on compatibility and the goals and policies in the comp plan. One of the issues that I'm looking at in the future as we develop more and more downtown, uh, these folks have the luxury of having uh, uh, um, uh, larger sites for the downtown area. Mm -hmm. But as uh, development comes in, we're going to be dealing with sites that are quite a bit smaller to try to fit this into. So I look in the future that <clears throat> we're going to have more issues with it than we're having today. And, 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 and what, what we anticipate, um, and, and I think um, there's enough historical evidence in other communities to, uh, to show that, and I think Ryan did a good example with his, what I would call a heat map showing how the, the, the footprint should be and as, as things develop is that you're gonna have some smaller parcels and they will come in and develop to the maximum they can under the, the zoning that they have. That the opportunities to do the very creative and innovative things happen when you acquire property. And so one of the, the questions from a land planning perspective always is, how, how do you encourage somebody to go through the time effort to assemble property t together uh, and, and it is, it's difficult um, because everybody has a different idea of what their property's worth and what should be built there and, and what they want to see. And so to assemble property um, becomes difficult and becomes more and more difficult the more successful uh, an area is. Uh, that being said, the regulations that are in the downtown plan currently work on, on an individual property basis. They can work better, potentially, and have a greater impact, and that greater impact hopefully leads to a quicker revival uh, if, if there is a way to encourage assemblage and the assemblage happens um, because there is more opportunities to do things. And it's, it's simple economics, um, but at the same point in time, the city's concern has to be how do we protect the city's interest in the vision and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and we can go through the staff report, and we will quickly now, but I think that in this instance, what they've done is, is unique in that they have carefully crafted this to be within a very specific area where the possibility for these assemblies exist, and it's their, it's their petition. It doesn't mean that after we do our white paper, we won't be back maybe to to uh, have a discussion on a, on a more holistic scale of this. But they wanted to make sure, uh, and, and staff agrees with this concept, that they weren't creating in any unintended consequences by putting it over the whole plan because they had, they had thought it through for their area in the town center and it makes sense there. Whether it makes sense core-wide uh, and everything else, we haven't examined that. We are doing that white paper and we will be looking at such things. Um, so from the perspective of their application, their petition, it, it is a solid uh, petition and, and it has been well thought out. Uh, it has been vetted heavily. Um, obviously, no secret, their, their interest is to make sure that once this is proved, approved, and, and it, assuming that it is, that they'll be able to come in and get something close to, if not, what they planned. So, I mean, there's no secret there, and that's the reason they're showing you, um, they're putting all the cards on the table for you. But the bottom line is, is that does this make sense? Um, from a staff perspective, yes. Are there any unintended consequences being so narrowly scoped we don't think so? And the other major property owners in the area is the city. Um, could this benefit the city 
if and when such time as they decide to um, redevelop the bamboo area and everything else, yeah, it probably could. It, it, it could have a positive impact even for what the city does that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise, uh, according to the comp plan. So there's, it has been vetted that way, it's been looked at, and th there's where it is. They have, they don't want any controversy, and they made it very clear, they're not asking for the bonus density for the unique or the bonus density for affordable. They have their own uh, vision of how they want to accomplish this, and, and there's where we are. Thank you. Let me s ask, uh, John, uh, yeah, I really like this project. It's a very good project. There's some things in here I need cleared up, though. Uh, there was a study done by RMPK Group, and he, he uh, prepared an 041 car to redevelopment master plan, town center concept plan. Mm -hmm. And then in the, uh, the uh, narrative here, or in the presentation, uh, we talk about the city needs to adopt this uh, master plan. And then we talk about this white paper that's being presented. And I guess my question would be, uh, are all those things linked and how are they linked? And should we wait for the white paper to see if there's any disagreements uh, with getting this amendment passed? I'll take the second question first. Um, the applicant has wanted their request to go forward. And they have every right, once their application is sufficient, to ask for their hearing to be scheduled. And that's why we're here today. Uh, I don't necessarily have any issues with us debating and making recommendations upon this, knowing there are decisions to make in the future. Uh, going back to the RMPK plan, O41 has been reviewed for a very long time by some very smart people. And all of them have had very interesting things to say. Uh, to date, we have not been able to see a lot of concrete evidence on the on the private side of the, the redevelopment. Uh, but I think that we are we are getting to the point where that that ship is turning. So, adopting rules, taking a look at how we're going to to handle O41 in the future, is something that's necessary because all of these ideas, all of these thoughts, all of these plans that have been presented in that some have been adopted, some haven't been over the years, uh, need to be what I'll call smoothed out. And it's not that any of the goals of those plans or any of those plans have been bad. They've all been very good. But what you've seen is as time has evolved and our regulations have been adopted, certain things apply in certain areas and, and certain things don't apply. Uh, and I make that general statement because one of those items is why we're here today. Uh, how do you handle assemblage of property that goes over one district? Can you, can you design your site to take advantage of both the intensity and, and uh, density that's afforded to you over your entire property? Uh, so that question, among other questions, is going to be something that this council is at least going to be asked. They may decide that what they have today is the perfect solution and they don't want any changes. They could decide the exact opposite and they want to go back and, and, and take a look at almost everything. But uh, as far as what's being presented to you in this hearing, I don't have any reservations about you debating and, and making recommendations on it because this is what we have today. If the council decides they want different rules tomorrow, then those will be the rules that we, we work underneath then. So what we're saying today, I mean, to make it clear, us passing this amendment change to the, the comprehensive plan uh, in no way uh, impact the city's decision on the white paper meaning there's no conflict there because this is one issue and that is another uh, if they change their idea about the the uh, zoning and land planning for the city in the white paper uh, the approval of this amendment has more to do with the mixed use development mm -hmm. which might be applicable in the white paper and what they decide and what we decide i mean when we approve the amendment that says that we like the mixed use idea for this property and others uh, is saying that we like the concept of mixed use and we see the city being developed on that basis in some cases. So in, it no way would affect our, our uh, approval of this amendment. No, sir. In fact, if there's one good thing about the timing of this request is that it does give us the opportunity to, to bring downtown back to the front of the minds of council 
before the white paper is discussed. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I don't know much about the white paper, just uh, this discussion this morning. So what is the white paper supposed to cover? Downtown. In general. <laughs> a little bit more specific. I think what we're going to try to cover is, is a little bit of the history so that we have some perspective on where we are today and All right. what are the current development standards, what are the current uses, what are the current issues, uh, what is the state of the city's investment and improvements downtown, and, and some thoughts on how we take that history and, and, and those uh, investments and move those forward. Okay, so a lot of that is already in our package. There is a significant Probably amount of that. There, now, there's going to be. Not in the detail you it's, have. It's a little more focused on this north side okay. uh, or north end of downtown, and the white paper will be more comprehensive. But yes, you see a lot of the analysis and a lot of the questions that will be asked then are at least coming to the forefront with, with this request. Okay. Uh, staff wants to make the presentation. Mr. Vincent, uh, yes. Alexis Crespo for the record. I had a I had a few more slides, but you guys have been very patient with us going through all the detail. I just want to put on the record that um, we are in agreement with the staff report that's rec recommending to transmit the amendment. Um, we agree it's in um, compliance and consistent with the local comprehensive plan, um, and we did would respectfully request your recommendation of approval. And mm, thank I'm you. Happy to answer further questions. Thank you very much. Just for the record, it's Jay speaking with Community Development. I'm going to go really quick through this because I think we've covered uh, the, Sorry about that, Jay. the vast majority of it. <clears throat> this is the application for a comp plan amendment um, to allow for some, some blending of, uh, of uses in the downtown. Just as a history, um, RMPK did a study in 2005 and they came up with the overall uh, downtown plan. Uh, Policy 1.1.11 established the old 41 center mixed use redevelopment overlay. Uh, and they also created the corridor redevelopment plan as part of that. And the same policy lists the land use and their associated intensities and, and densities uh, by sub area. Uh, the same master redevelopment plan is, was adopted uh, into the land development code. And the owners within the overlay are required to develop a redevelopment conformance with all the applicable redevelopment overlay regulations. Uh, the applicant is asking to build three mixed-use buildings uh, with a private amenity, uh, two multifamily residential buildings. Uh, the two mixed-use buildings are located on commercial and multifamily area of the overlay, which do not allow for residential uses for integration to vertical uh, mixed use. Jay, what is the private amenity? I believe it's a, uh, is it still a pool? Your private amenity? The, 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 the recreation, the dock. I can answer it. I mean, we reserved a small square on the west side um, building, the west side of the western building, uh, west of US 41, as an outdoor space that could support things like a very small pool uh, within a fenced area. It could support a, a patio area with perhaps an outdoor grill for the residents to be able to use. Uh, it's not programmed and designed specifically. However, it's just an ancillary or accessory use to those. So buildings. that is roughly behind Maria's. Yes. Correct. And does it, does it having an amenity there, which is not, I guess, very intense? I'm assuming. Is that because of the coastal high hazard area? No. It's not because of that. It's because of the, the, the flexibility of the land plan um, and the, the need to put respectful parking in the right places for the buildings. That area had uh, leftover space that was central and accessible to all the users. Okay. But very low intensity is the intent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the applicant filed the, the text amendment that we've been talking about. And uh, mixed use developments are intended to permit mixed use residential not to see 20 inch per acre with commercial, light, industrial, uh, live work. And so th this, this gets into the, the thing 
uh, before, and that's with uh, there's ways to get the bonus densities and so forth. Okay, but uh, you're not asking for bonus they're, density. They're not. They're not asking for any of that. This is just to give you background, because. Well, I was just curious why, about why, the why, why why it is very helpful for them to present their plan, and it's very enlightening because you see what this would allow to happen. The fact is, is this text amendment is just for this text. So they will be back in, uh, and they've already waiting on this to process their plans, but they, this is not a review of their plan at this time. This is the, the text amendment. And when staff looks at the text amendment, we look at what anybody could come in and, and do with it. And so it's very helpful uh, for their graphics to show uh, the outcome and it's very helpful for staff in evaluating a petition to make sure that the proper verbiage is put in so that's the cost that's what we get that's the result but technically that's not part of this petition okay and let me could I ask one other sure. thing too because if it's 20 per acre and there's only 3.4 3.6 acres and they're asking for 80 that doesn't multiply out well, there, there is. That's why I asked the question about okay. bonus. There, 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 there is a, a whole variety of things here. When you own, you're allowed to calculate density based upon your road right of way that's adjacent to you under our code. Um, it is presumed that, and it's actually part of our code and statute, that if a road is vacated, that the underlying ownership goes to the adjacent property owners. Uh, our code recognizes that and allows you to use half of the width of the right of way adjacent to your property for the purpose of calculating density. They, they're fortunate, they have properties on both sides, so they can use all the right of way. And so when you start doing all these things, their densities work out. So that's how you get a little bit higher than if you just multiply Right, so, so right. gross density and net density can be very misleading. Uh, the classic example, way off subject, but the classic example of gross density Someone lives in a golf course community, and they say, I live in an area where I have two units per, per acre, but they live on a 50 by 100 foot lot, which is actually more like seven or eight units per acre. So are you talking about the gross or you're talking about the net? Gross is one thing, you know, net is something else. And so in, all, in our parlance, we're talking about gross. Okay? Okay. Um, Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, to encourage... Uh, the, the requested language, we've already gone through this, uh, is so that they can blend uh, across. Uh, they, I think they did a very good job in explaining it. This is just where we, we are repeating everything that they have uh, uh, talked about in the amendments. Now, here, here is something that we wanted to make sure um, wasn't confusing, and, and I think we've, we've shown that it isn't confused. This is the urban core uh, portion uh, and this is where certain uses are allowed and one of the things in the text amendment is we talk about this which is even though and I'm gonna go back even though we mentioned criteria within the urban core it's only the urban core that falls within the town center area so um, it's not all the way down to Ragsdale or to Hampton. It is only that area, uh, this amendment as proposed, is only for the area within the town center, even though you, you do see the urban core language. Um, in order to get this, you have to apply for a plan development that is not a use by right. That is something that does not have to be approved. It's uh, something that's reviewed um, by the planning commission and the city council. It is at their discretion. Um, and so that is one of the other things that staff is reason we're favorable for this. It gives an opportunity to sit down and look to see what is in the best interest of the community as a whole and for them and staff to make that case uh, to the city council. Uh, again, uh, the same regulations, how it would be reviewed, the schedule of uses. Um, I know that oftentimes people are worried about certain schedule of uses, what could go in here, especially in mixed use uh, situation. What I will say to you though is, is this, 
uh, if they're selling these units, they're going to have condominium documents, and if they do a plan development, we will require the property platted. <clears throat> when that happens, uh, myself as the city surveyor and the city attorney look at the property owner association documents. We look at the um, condominium documents to ensure that there's things are properly done. Um, and so that's just another level of, of review to let everybody know. Um, and it's important, I think, as people become used to the idea of mixed use, that there is a, a level of review that they're not going to, you know, all of a sudden there's not going to be a bar on the third floor, um, and something's not going to get snuck in, that there's actually a procedure, and that um, the proper things are done. Uh, their site plan, as, as they have um, proposed, and this is a, uh, I think, a reasonable example of what can happen. They have, they show on the site plan, and let me, you have here, this is uh, where Maria's is, uh, their amenity, parking in the rear, uh, mixed use building. Um, here, this would have, is in the 3B, it's a commercial building, but they are asking for mixed use. Here you have, you have the uh, Speedway gas station here, and for whatever reason, on the RMP plan, this was to be multifamily residential and this over here multifamily residential. This gives them the opportunity to take and say, you know what, from a planning perspective, and this is why it's important to understand that they have to meet the requirements within the comp plan, that over here where you're surrounded by residential, um, this would be residential and they need to, uh, to justify uh, how that interacts with that area. On the other hand, it's not unreasonable for someone to request some sort of mixed use uh, to buffer against a gas station, um, whether they just put straight residential there. On the other hand, you don't want to, you don't want all commercial here because you do have the residential over here. So again, it's one of those things: are they meeting the intent of the comp plan, and are they applying the appropriate policies? This is just an example um, of the type of things you would see. Uh, we've listed the, uh, what's allowed in the uh, mixed use district as, as by right typically. Uh, this does not represent anything that they have requested, but it's just an, an idea to get, so that you would understand uh, the type of things that could be downstairs and what you have upstairs. And it could range from barbershops and art galleries, to restaurants, um, you know, it, it, is, it is that. Uh, the thing about the PD, when they come in for a PD, they can request uses, and staff can also ask them to eliminate uses if, they, if we see use that we feel is inappropriate as part of uh, the buffer. Now, we have not done that yet, but it is very conceivable that there may be a use we wouldn't want here that would be okay here because of the nature of where it's located. And so that, that's something that would be evaluated as appropriate at that time. Again, the, the just uh, it goes on, and this is the other thing: they have to be consistent with the the comprehensive plan. And so, all the we're not changing any of the goals, policies, or objectives of the comprehensive plan. So, the same things that they would need to adhere to, they still have to adhere to. This is just allowing them an opportunity to say we've acquired some property, and because of that, there's a better plan, and because of that it can be a better plan because they have frontage and maybe they go a little deeper in the commercial or put the residential over here a little bit better but they still have to meet all the requirements of the comprehensive yeah. plan could, could i ask one question sure. too about that uh, i hope i can make my question clear so now let's say you, you have a mixed use building maybe the upper floors are residential and the bottom commercial and you've got something like for instance, the dry cleaners that wants to move in there at a later date. Um, and the people, you know, that probably might not be a good use, and it's allowed because it was on your, your list. So would something like that then go to the city council for or, or your staff for determination if that kind of thing is allowed? Because that kind of um, thing 
may come after the building's already built and ready to be rented. And, Do you and, see what I'm saying? And the um, answer to that is yes, no, and maybe, and I'm going to go over each of those with you real quick. Okay. I mean, um, they could, may want a drugstore, a little drugstore or could, something, could or a quick in, store, but they it, may not want a dry cleaner because sure. of the fumes. Based upon the list of uses, um, they are allowed to have, uh, if it is something that's allowed as use by right, yes, it could go in. It's one of the reasons, though, that we make sure that those things are appropriately put in the POA documents and the condominium documents. And, and trust me, they, they would do that even if we weren't making them because they don't want to get sued from the people that have sold condos. So too. you're saying you would take the ones, the uses that are already approved for that, for that area, and then you would select the ones specifically for these, with, these, these buildings the PD. and allow them to be there but not the other ones. Is that what you're with, saying? Within, within the PD, they would come in and they would, make a, they would say, we would we'd like to see these uses. And they, they might say every use allowed in 6A. And if we felt, if the staff felt that a use was inappropriate, we would say so and say, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to recommend that. We would recommend okay. this. Ultimately, the city council makes that decision. If the use is allowed, the use is allowed. And so um, if a toy shop is allowed and a barber is allowed and there's only one space and the toy shop goes in business, then they can rent it to a barber because that's something that's allowed. So that's a yes, they, they can change uses. Um, if it's specifically not allowed, no, they can't put it in there. But the, when you the say not allowed, I mean, both of those uses or whatever could be allowed in the whole commercial area but and would have been allowed on this property but I now because of the residences up above it would no longer be appropriate well, and you're saying the city council or the staff would make that decision it would be written in the right. do documents before it, it, right it depends on how it's requested and it depends on how it's proved which is why i think that maybe we're a little ahead of ourselves to answer your question it isn't Jay my said, concern yes, though yeah well and it's also a concern of the zoning board and the city council Good. um but what I, I think that will happen is you'll have a request for a schedule of uses, which will include the residential uses, obviously, and also a list of commercial uses. How they break those down, whether it's by building or whether that's by project, that is yet to be seen. And that's going to be depending on, one, how it's submitted to us by the applicant and ultimately how it's going to be approved by city council. Because the only thing that really matters when this is all said and done is what is approved by city council, because those are the uses that are either going to be allowed to go into those buildings, certain buildings, all buildings, no buildings, uh, or not allowed. So uh, we do take a look at it. It's not, uh, in fact, I would say that we probably look at it a lot more specifically today than at any other point in this city's history. So um, yeah, all I can do is tell you that it is something that will be reviewed when it is, when it is submitted. Until I see something, I can't tell you what. <laughs> but there, there is a possibility that those uses would be fewer than the ones that were originally proved, approved for that uh, particular I would, I, I, All I would area. tell you is that the only thing that really matters is what is approved by the city council. There could be, there could be uh, internal separations, requirements, restrictions that they, they place upon themselves, mm -hmm. but the only thing that really matters is the document that is approved by the city council because when um, someone is asking us what can go into a particular space that's the document that we're going to look at mm -hmm. if they choose to as a property manager or as an owner of a building to place further restrictions upon themselves that's something that they can do but it is not something that we get involved with it's, it, i look at that as the same way as deed restrictions which uh, mm -hmm. could be a good thing it could be a bad thing but it is not something that the city involves itself yeah, I, I was just concerned for the people who might be the residents above might have a problem with something that is approved for that that area, but would not, but because now there are residents there, it would not be good for the residents, or they would not be happy with it. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons we make sure it's included within the POA mm -hmm. and condo okay. docs. Well, you're making me feel better. So, so, <laughs> so that anybody who's buying there, if they get those and they read them, they understand. Um, you know what it is that's going on thank you so um, we talked about the policies that they that they need, still need to adhere to this is the policy about downtown uh, how mixed-use works um, the walkability 
Uh, we also have a policy 1.1.22 that says lower intensity uses shall be located adjacent to residential uses. So when they come in, just because they're blending across different uh, um, zoning districts, they're not going to be able to meet all the requirements also to try to put a commercial area where it doesn't, it doesn't belong. So they still have to meet all of these, these regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, everything, they gotta meet the level of service uh, standards. So everything that we talk about, that the comp plan requires, LEC plans, they're not getting a break from any of that. It's just that they're getting the opportunity to benefit from the assemblage of property uh, and in a way that should benefit the city. They're not requesting uh, an increase uh, of what they could have otherwise. Um, our recommendation is to transfer this to the state for their review. And then of course, we've had questions, but we have any more questions, we'll, we'll go from there. I have none. Uh, I, have none. I just want to be clear, these are units for purchase rather than for rent? Not something that we can control. Right. I see. Okay. Specifically, we're not allowed by state statute okay. to do that. <laughs> Another, I, I, I'm just curious and I'm learning a lot, so please, I thank you for bearing with me. Um, there was something in the back um, about uh, not having reused water. Is that something that would be a possibility of, of looking at for a lot of these properties? It would be something that we would always look at, just that the, the, the statement they were making is a statement of the current condition. Um, and if reuse is available down there, it's going to be available for everyone. It's How not do you change a current condition, though? How do you change it? Oh, well, you probably that provide particular more material one with for reuse water. With water. <laughs> Since we don't own the utility <laughs> that provides the reuse water, that's something that the city can only encourage. Um, uh, you know, the utility would have to, would have to put in pipes. Um, and, and, and know that there's a, uh, a market for the water. Um, if this was a big vacant 500 acres, it'd be pretty easy to get them to do it. But the cost and everything else, it, it would be difficult probably to get BSU to do it. Mm -hmm. So you know, we always encourage them, but it, it really is part of their, uh, their mandate. And then the other thing is, how much do they have to sell? If they've already committed to sell so much, you know, you can only, you only produce so much. It's not like water, a well where you're constantly pumping out of the ground. The reuse water, there's a limited quantity. And so if they have uh, committed that, it makes it difficult for it to be cost effective to put doom pipelines in. Okay. Okay, is that all the questions? I had, well, I had a couple of things that um, may be a little different but I noticed when Audrey read this into the record she she read um, policy 1.1.15 and I thought it was 1.1.11 perhaps dot a dot five so I think maybe if that's in written in other places it should be looked at and perhaps changed I think that what you're seeing, and I see exactly what you're saying, what's on the cover of the agenda is not the same policies that is under, uh, on page two for the request. The request yeah. is 1.1.11.8.5. Yeah, right. that's what I'm saying. Agreed. Agreed. We'll, we'll, we'll change so that. You, if, you, if you start, if this gets approved, and we it will gets make sure in the that's record, we'll it, it should be correct. Um, I, I think I had, I had one other question on this, this document too, if I can find it. Um, there is, I think, since there aren't any pages, this is really hard to get to. Um, it's under attachment A, it's about a third of the way in on the front, and it's about one, two, three, about the fourth page of attachment A. I don't see it. It follows the staff analysis by a few pages. You finish the staff analysis, come up to attachment A, and it's about third or fourth page in. And when I was referring. What's at the top of that page that you're looking at? It starts, provisions shall be based okay. on policy. Now, down to that page, my copy of the comp plan stops at six. This 
continues to 7, and it starts about Belts Avenue subdistrict. I think that that shouldn't be there. I think you might have an old copy of the comp plan, but I'll take a look at it. Hmm. Well, so Belts Avenue subdistrict is part of, of this? Of the comp plan. Uh, part hmm. of the comp plan. Yeah, this, it's, not this in, it's not in the comp plan, but it's here. So are you meaning for it to be here? Yeah, yeah this, this is just backup to give you information. This is just portions of the comp plan, so to give you perspective. Yes, this I understand that, but I think it's not, this number seven is not in my comp plan, but it's here. So I'm um, yeah, thinking you, that you, Feltz Avenue is a different subject. I mean, I know there's a, you know, there's I'll a take a look at your that, comp plan to see what, what, what the issue is. And there's several pages of it, because it stops talking about the, um, the mixed-use redevelopment overlay and starts about the Feltz Avenue subdistrict. I'll take a look at your comp plan to make sure oh, it's up to date. Sorry about that. Nope. <coughs> City Council probably yeah. is going to look at this. And okay. Is that it? All right. Uh, okay. I'd like to open this for public comment, please. Anyone who wishes to come in on a project, please uh, identify yourself. <coughs> Hello. John Pano with the Benita Springs Downtown Alliance and with the um, CGT Kayaks uh, right here in Benita Springs. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to to mention first off um, the Alliance has gone to the council and made several recommendations <laughs> about a, a unified or a comprehensive plan for downtown um, including zoning and, and directional signs and things like that uh, I see this is actually a catalyst to help um, make those things happen so I would encourage you to um, to support this plan uh, secondly uh, the designs fit very much with our downtown and um, doing local walks, history walks through downtown. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, this kind of development happen. Uh, um, representing the businesses and people downtown, we're all excited to see um, this development come in and we're excited to see you folks and, and the developer um, working so hard to make this happen when um, it would be probably easier to develop in land that's not scarred or that hasn't been uh, hasn't been touched. Uh, so uh, on all these points uh, we support uh, this development. On a personal note, being a kayak uh, person, um, I know that they're planning to put in um, a kayak launcher, uh, what I like to call a, uh, a motorless marina. Uh, so that people would have access, the public would ag have access to the Imperial River and um, the beautiful uh, scenes and things along the river that we have. So um, for all these points and, and many more, I'm sure, uh, we support this and we would like to see this project proceed. Thank Excellent you. comments, John. Thank you. Any other comments? Hi, good morning. My name is Tom Runyon and I'm with uh, Benita Development Company and we support this mm -hmm. project. Uh, we think it's uh, a very high quality project, well thought out, uh, as was explained today, and uh, we're excited to see it uh, come to fruition. We think it's a type of high quality project that downtown specifically and uh, the city of Benita desires, and uh, we're very excited to see it come about. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. I don't usually come, Kathy McGrath, for the record. I usually don't come to these meetings, but I'm excited about this project. And I just want to tell you why. It goes way back. Bob and I bought our first property in Benita in 1967. And we, they were small rental units on Illinois Street, Oak Creek. And then we built a few more. But in 1979, we built Nelson Plaza. And nobody knew the McGraths, so we were friends. And we named it Nelson Plaza. And we became members of the old 41 Business Association, which is kind of like what they've done with the Downtown Alliance. And it included like uh, Al Greenwood, Ben Senior, uh, Wanda Sweeten, who was then manager of the Bamboo Mobile Home Park, um, Tina Shooklet Bull, the Lyles family, and uh, a gentleman named Al Roseman who worked for Grady Minor. Rex, were you part of that? I, I thought, Rex, I, I don't want to leave anyone out. But you know, this was, this was in the 70s and, uh, or late 70s, early 80s, and we tried our best Riverside Park was just grass and dirt. 
but we did work hard and we put electricity there and a fencing there and um, the Lyles would plant the little Christmas tree and Bob and I one time had cocoa with the extension cord across the F Florida Fidelity. It was kind of the <laughs> beginning of holiday in the park. But I've always been interested and wanted to see more done. And let's face it, Benita didn't start moving until we incorporated. We were always the tail that wagged the dog. And then they did some beautiful things. Look what they did with Riverside Park. And then uh, I was so pleased when the previous council voted with this redevelopment. And I love the concept. I love the mixed use. A little town I grew up in, Egg Harbor, New Jersey, we had that. You know, downstairs, it didn't look like this, but downstairs commercial, upstairs living. But, and remember too, we go back a little bit, remember when the community redevelopment, they tried, each little group tried, but we got nowhere until we incorporate it. And of course, there's a lot of uh, legal things to go. I know Jay and John described it very, very well. Um, all I'm saying is I'm so excited. I've been so excited about downtown Bonita, and I really want to see this happen. I don't have any financial gain. In fact, I only met Mr. Tony recently when I saw this project. So I just wanted you to know that I think it's great. Go for it. Thank you, Kathy. I'm Susie Sager, and I'm an owner of Heaven Sent Flowers and for Heaven Shakes Ice Cream. By the way, pumpkin ice cream is in now, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wanting to just piggyback with everybody else. This was a great presentation. I've seen a little bit of it before, but this is very, very comprehensive of what's going on. This is the phase two of what we want to do for downtown. Phase one's pretty well done. The downtown's beautiful again. Um, we've got our roundabouts in. We've got um, people trafficking coming in saying, geez, things look great. We're so excited, but what's next? You know, there's, there's nothing new. There's nothing. We're all the same vendors, same thing going on. This type of a project is exactly what we need to start to move forward. So I'm ready with a golden shovel and um, a big old <laughs> red bow for Tony. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to, let's move forward on it. This is exactly what we need. The mixed use is, is just perfect for what we, our vision is for phase two. So I, I'm highly in favor of it also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. But let's face it, too, the library is going to come. I think the yes. county commissioners just approved that. We've always said, let's make this a destination, not a thoroughfare that you just, you know, if you want to do that, take US 41. Yeah, right. but, and it's really, really coming to be that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one more comment. Uh, I would like to congratulate Mark and Tony for bringing this project to Benita. It's a very nice project. I think your design team did a wonderful job, and it'll be a nice fit for Benita. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any further comment? Ready for more? Well, ready for motion. <coughs> uh, I'm prepared to make a motion that we approve this uh, amendment as presented uh, to the amendment to the complaint. Do Does that put you in a hand? It yeah. recommend that the city council transmit this amendment to the state? Yes. Yes. Uh, so second? Yeah, I'll second, second that. Yeah, as, okay. That is uh, corrected by the director. Okay, we'll take a vote, please. Caroline Gallagher? Aye. Rex Sims? Aye. Chairman Vincent? Chairman Vincent? Oh, aye. I, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. Linda Schwartz. Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank, could, you. Could Thank I, all who attended. Could I just say something, too? Sure. Okay. Um, it does sound like a very nice project to me, and I appreciated the, the diagrams. They were great. And particularly, Jay, uh, uh, giving me the assurances that, you know, that the city is going to be watch basically watching over this when they do the writing, the uh, position uh, of the program and so on. So I do appreciate that. It puts me at ease. Now you're on news, Jay. I'm on news. <laughs> <laughs> and John. Put me on Thank everyone for attending. <laughs>